As with all the other speakers who came before me, I'm very much humbled to be here today in the presence of so many experts in the field of uh, healthcare and tuberculosis and uh, public service. I'm very, very honored and uh, grateful to be in this beautiful land here in the territory of the various First Nations who are party to Treaty 1 and also uh, the homeland of the Métis peoples. And I'm grateful to the elders for opening our hearts to listen more closely to the important information that's being shared here today and to take it personally, to really act on that. So thank you for having me here. It really is uh, a pleasure on, for me to be able to share with you today. Um, my brief overview today comes from, uh, from work that I've completed since the late 1990s. It took me 12 years to research my book, and I did my work in oral history at a time when speaking about experience in institutional, institutions like residential schools and Indian hospitals was not a popular thing. And just before arriving here in Winnipeg, of course, uh, there came the announcement of the class action lawsuit that's been uh, initiated on behalf of patients of Canada's Indian hospital system. Fundamentally, tuberculosis is about people, and so I do want to open by giving thanks uh, to those who supported my work and also, I'm not sure which button to press, but oops, uh, and also those who experienced tuberculosis in their life and who experienced the institutions that I'll be talking about this morning. My presentation really is not very long. I'll try to uh, horse through it as fast as I can so as not to take the time of other speakers. But I want to break it into two parts. Uh, firstly, I would just like to share with you a very basic history of Canada's Indian hospital system. And I, I use that terminology because that was the official terminology of the day. And second of all, I wanted to make a connection between those hospital facilities and other institutions in Canada. The individuals shown in the slide here are two very important people who have inspired my work, uh, Maria Campbell and Kathleen Anderson or Kathleen Steinhauer. Kathleen was a registered nurse at the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital, and it was she who in 1997 said to me, Lori, this story is bigger than the Indian residential school story. And she scared the pants off me and, you know, encouraged me to continue the historical research on that front. This map here is too small for you to see all the tiny speckles all over it, but it represents uh, an illustration of the many Indian health service facilities that were uh, created across Canada starting in 1945 when Indian Health Services were created under the Department of National Health and Welfare. After World War II, the Canadian government made a commitment to uh, attempt to address the desperate tuberculosis epidemic that was raging through Indigenous communities, Inuit, Métis, and Indian. And it established 15 hospitals in 1945. There were also numerous nursing outposts and health centers distributed across primarily northwestern Canada, although some facilities in eastern Canada were also deployed or wrangled into uh, helping uh, to address this health situation. In addition, there was a loose web of affiliated other institutions, church hospitals, public facilities, public sanatoria, etc. Charles Campbell Indian Hospital was the largest hospital within this network created by the federal government. It was kind of the jewel in the crown of the healthcare facilities, and it contained, at the time of its uh, founding, 310 beds. The second largest institution was on Canada's west coast, where I currently live, uh, in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. The Nanaimo Hospital had 210 beds. In contrast, there were many smaller hospitals strewn across our landscape uh, in Inuvik, in Norway House, in Brandon, and you know, many, many different small places. And these were much smaller hospitals with bed sizes 22, 15, you know, 60. Uh, so there was a whole range of these kinds of uh, facilities. Indian Health Services ran this system of healthcare institutions, and in 1962, 
Uh, of course, departmental names change, uh, branch names change within the federal service, and in 1962, it became the medical services branch. These hospitals ran uh, probably until the 70s, and one by one, they were decommissioned. The Nanaimo Indian Hospital is pictured here. You can see from the style of the buildings that uh, this was a decommissioned or a repurposed military um, establishment. The buildings have since been plowed under, and uh, for the first 10 years that I worked at Vancouver Island University, my view was of those buildings. So they were standing there empty. Here is a, a sample photo of the Inuvik Indian Hospital. The TB rate uh, among Canada's indigenous population in the 1940s was 10 times the national average. And when I see the statistics presented here today, I realize that uh, a, a great deal has changed, but some things have not so much. And tuberculosis was considered a threat to the general public. And so the federal government decided to take on this challenge, not because it believed that it had a legal duty to do so, although it is, has a fiduciary obligation to registered Indian people and also to care for the Inuit, but it believed it was its moral duty. And so the, the number of resources that were uh, funneled towards this activity, I would say were uh, not as full as they could have been. Very briefly, uh, I just wanted to discuss life in an Indian hospital. I'm sure as healthcare professionals and people involved in this, uh, you're familiar with some of the older treatment processes for tuberculosis. But life in an Indian hospital was really characterized by a regimentation. They had a series of routines, routine one, routine two, right through to routine four. In routine one, a patient would have full bed rest with no freedom of movement a little brochure handed to patients said, you may sit up in a chair once a month. For the rest, patients were confined to bed. In routine two, you were up three times a day for 15 minutes. You may sit in a chair once a day while your bed is being made. Routine three, of course, upped the number of times that a person might get out of bed, and you were allowed to visit other people. And finally, in routine four, patients were encouraged to walk around and be free. Many of the photos I'm showing here are uh, publicity photos from uh, Indian Health Services or from the Medical Services branch, and this photo here is of uh, young women in the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital. All ages were represented with tuberculosis, there is no limit to who can get it, when, as you all understand. And uh, small babies right through to the elderly were in these various hospital facilities. This is a, a charming picture, uh, kind of cute, I have to say. Always makes me smile. On the other hand, it, it belies kind of a, another history in that when mothers came into the hospitals, it was not uncommon for them, if they were pregnant and had given birth within that uh, facility, for them to experience sterilization at the hands of the healthcare providers. Obviously, there were lengthy and very painful treatments. Early on, antibiotics, uh, thank God they were developed or we would be in worse shape than we are today, were del delivered by needle. And uh, as I understand from the oral history of the patients, very large needles that were painful that no one looked forward to. Subsequently, uh, the antibiotics were redeployed in pill form, and the pills were very, very large, tasted horrible, and uh, hard to swallow. Gradually, of course, all these things became uh, much easier to take, and uh, outpatient programs were developed. Uh, I've had many people share with me that when they received the big blue horse pills after the needles, that they secretly spit them out in their beds and, uh, you know, try to avoid that, not, not possibly knowing uh, what they were taking them for. Other uh, parts of treatment, of course, included immobilization in casts, uh, shells, they were called, whether they were half-body casts, and this was done with young children as well as with adults. A uh, striker frame is illustrated here in this photo, which was a kind of a device in which could immobilize a person who had uh, bone tuberculosis. And 
obviously not a comfortable thing to be immobilized by, but it was considered necessary. There were good times in hospital. Because people had very lengthy stays, it was, wasn't uncommon for people to be there for years. I've heard of people being there for months, but also of people being in hospital for up to eight years, eight, nine years. And if a, a person was uh, admitted at the age of four or five, that would be an entire childhood spelt, spent within the institution. Uh, this photo comes from the yearbooks that they kept at the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital, kind of like high school or junior high school yearbooks. Uh, fun things were photographed and celebrated, and you'd be surprised how many weddings there were in the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital. So uh, love did flourish, but under <coughs> adverse circumstances. There was also a great deal of training that occurred, most of it within the Charles Campbell Indian Hospital because it was a training hospital and it had a relationship with the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And so, uh, although there's very little documentation of this, um, staff and doctors within the facility made attempts to train indigenous former patients or other uh, people, young people coming from residential school to take on roles as technicians, as nurses' aides, and hopefully eventually uh, take on more professional roles, perhaps becoming registered nurses. So th there were also uh, workshops and, and training uh, programs set up for community health aides, for example, and sanitation aides within Charles Campbell. So there was a professionalization that was being attempted there, uh, something which would require further research to figure that out. And this is an example of a classroom. Of course, uh, life in hospital also could end in tragedy and death. And uh, many people passed away in these facilities. It's not entirely clear always what happened when those who passed on, uh, what was done with their remains. And in the case of Edmonton, uh, when people passed away in Charles Campbell, if their remains were not able to be sent home because the expense was too much, they were buried out in, uh, in St. Albert in the uh, cemetery for the Edmonton uh, Indian Residential School. Their graves were dug by the students of the residential school, and they were unmarked. I had the honor of uh, visiting that site with... Uh, some elders from Cambridge Bay a couple of years ago who were visiting for the first time their parents' site. Both their parents had passed away, a group of sisters, and uh, they had never been to where their parents uh, had been buried, and they, in fact, had never known what had happened to their parents. So this is a living legacy of the experience of TB. This is the cemetery, and... Uh, the location of individuals are not marked. If you're interested in reading more about this, there are publications. I've had uh, people approach me and say, why didn't we know about this? Why don't people talk about this ever? I think some of the information is hidden in academic research, and I would really encourage people to avail themselves of some of the facts and, and knowledge that is there. My own book was published in 2012-2013. A tiny bit of the information has come out through uh, the final reports of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015, and Maureen Lux uh, has published the book Separate Beds, which is not so much about the oral histories, but rather the documentary history. Very quickly, uh, because I don't want to take too much time, but I did want to make a very important point, which is not commonly understood, and that is that these healthcare facilities were intricately <laughs> intertwined with the residential school system. And even just making that point um, is sort of a new thing. I'd also like to add that the hospitals and the residential schools were very much intertwined with other institutions within Canadian society, like our justice system and the foster care system. So to actually talk about Indian hospitals separately is a little bit of a... Uh, strange representation, and residential schools separately, they're all part of a long chain of institutionalization that I think needs to be addressed. 
Uh, just to show you some of the documentary evidence around this, there were schools inside the Indian hospitals. So children were given an education and were lent teachers, instructors from residential schools who then helped them carry on their education while they were in hospital because some of them were in hospital for such a long time. Again, a publicity photo here and some uh, correspondence that indicates a child attended school within the hospital. This is an example of kind of a, a spreadsheet used by teachers in the Capel Indian Hospital to show how many kids they had in what grade. You probably can't read it from where you're sitting, but uh, again, just a piece of document that indicates what was carried on. There was also a great deal of movement from the schools to the hospitals. And these documents here indicate students who have been removed from a particular school into a hospital facility because they were diagnosed with tuberculosis. And uh, we have a couple of examples here. A child moved to the Nanaimo Indian Hospital, another one returned, uh, one to a hospital in the Lytton, and another one. There was also movement from the hospitals back to the schools. So as a child was sick in hospital and perhaps couldn't return home to their parents for whatever was deemed uh, the reason for that, the children were moved um, to residential schools. And I spoke with num a number of people uh, to whom this had happened. And uh, it was not done with parental consent, per se. And so sometimes children were moved to other facilities without their families knowing where they had gone to. So the impact of TB isn't just the illness and being institutionalized in a hospital. It can also mean eventual separation from a family by being moved to residential school and then on from there, never to return home. Lastly, there is a back and forth. You could move one way, you could move the other way, but some children were bounced back and forth between school and hospital and school and hospital. Even bouncing between hospitals was a reality. So a, student, uh, a child could be ill, an adult could be ill, in Miller Bay Hospital in Prince Rupert, be moved down to Nanaimo for certain treatment, and then over to Edmonton for a specialized operation. There was no guarantee that those individuals would return to their home community subsequently. Overall, all I can you know, emphasize to you is that there was a lot of mixing and moving. And these institutions, again, as I mentioned, very much overlapped. Uh, in Indian residential schools overlapped with the hospitals and also public hospitals because they uh, were in relationship with the Indian hospitals. Children could be moved from hospital to foster care if they couldn't return home. And there are uh, many examples of that that I've come across. Children were also moved, let's say, from school to hospital to a detention center or a juvenile uh, facility for bad kids. Um, I've read correspondence where children uh, misbehaved in hospital after all their treatments and, of course, having to be still and take medication that didn't make them feel good and not being with family. Many of them acted out. Some of these ended up being uh, placed in detention centers or correctional facilities. Another thing that happened in hospital was as ch children and young people got better, there was a move uh, through programs to train these young people to take on labor positions. So they would be funneled towards becoming, let's say, cleaners or technicians within the hospital, and from there moved on, with the help of hospital officials, into other labor positions in various urban settings so that they wouldn't go back up north. You might imagine uh, this would be very much the case uh, among the Inuit, who, for whom it would be extra difficult to pay for the trip back home, and perhaps their health was compromised in such a way that it would be difficult for them to live back in their home community. And so these programs encourage these young people to stay in Edmonton, to stay in, in a city like Toronto or elsewhere, and as a result, lose touch with uh, their extended community. In my work for uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it became apparent to me that this is how people went missing. And it wasn't so much that they passed away or that they disappeared into thin air, but what happened was that people's names were changed, people's associations, their connections to those who did know them were lost, and uh, the conclusion is, quote unquote, missing. They're not really gone, they're just in a different setting and sense and have assumed a different kind of identity. 
many people were dislocated by the results of these institutionalized processes. I, I could stop there, but I wanted to add one last point, and uh, I really appreciate uh, being able to present some of this information. One thing that has struck me over the course of my research, both for TRC and for the history of this medical system, is that the notion of consent was something that really was uh, disregarded, deliberately neglected, and even falsified. And I have to say that I, I was shocked to come across some of this documentation, but there was in the 1950s and 1960s uh, particularly in the 60s is perhaps the most interesting to me, um, correspondence between doctors and nurses about the need to obtain consent from patients for their treatments, whether those were treatments for TB or any kind of other uh, invasive treatment related uh, as an ancillary operation to TB treatment, things like sterilization uh, or any other kind of um, uh, any other kind of work done on them. Uh, doctors and nurses agreed amongst themselves that it would be unnecessary to seek that kind of consent from the patient or to inform them of what was being done to them because of language barriers, because of lack of education of the patients, and uh, because of what they believed uh, the population who they had in these institutions would be able to understand, comprehend, and deal with. And so uh, there are enough examples to demonstrate that this was a pattern. Was this unusual in this time period? I would say no. And this is something that really we haven't addressed and haven't talked about. It leaves a legacy that again opens up the doors for what happened the other day, and that is the initiation of a class action lawsuit against the federal government on behalf of all those patients. Um, where this will lead, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm very... Uh, moved by the fact that people who have had these experiences now feel the courage uh, to stand up and share their truths. Thank you so much for listening.